Hi, this is Dr. Mike Chupp, and you are listening to CMDA Matters, the weekly podcast of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. Well, today's interview, it's a rather sobering discussion about a reality that faces millions of children in the United States and across the world due to the global pandemic, and that is child orphanhood. It's something that I witnessed firsthand while serving as a medical missionary in Kenya over a couple of decades, children who lost one or both parents because of the AIDS epidemic. You will hear from our guest today that so many more children are now facing a life of uncertainty after the death of either one or both parents due to COVID-19. Our guest has decades of experience in this particular field, and I'm thankful she took a few minutes out of her busy schedule as a professor and researcher at Oxford University to share with us and to give us some insight, honestly, into how we can make a difference for these children. So I welcome you to listen in to my recent interview with Dr. Susan Hillis. Well, it's my privilege today to welcome to CMDA Matters, Dr. Susan Hillis, who works at the University of Oxford. She's the co-chair of the Global Reference Group on Children Affected by COVID-19 and Crisis, hosted by the World Health Organization. She's also been serving for a long time with uh, PEPFAR, uh, the President's Emergency Provision for AIDS Relief, as the Senior Technical Advisor for Faith and Communities Initiatives. Dr. Hillis is Dean for the Continuing Medical and Dental Education for uh, Global Professionals Serving in Mission Hospitals, uh, one of the oldest ministries, actually, of CMDA as a commission. Previously, She was senior scientist at the CDC on the COVID-19 task force. What an incredible responsibility in these last couple of years. Her research has led to more than 145 peer-reviewed publications addressing global HIV, violence against children, sexually transmitted infections, COVID-19 and orphans and vulnerable children, which is going to be the heart of our conversation today. Dr. Hillis received a PhD in epidemiology from the University of North Carolina and then served as a CDC Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer. In the U.S. Public Health Service, she was a a captain, and Captain Hillis received the Meritorious Service Medal for Global Contributions to Strengthening Public Health. She and her husband... They love children, and they are parents of 11 children and grandparents of 11 grandchildren. That is amazing, Dr. Hillis. So welcome to the program today. Thank you so much, Mike. It's great to be here. Along came COVID, and Dr. Susan Hillis, you had an idea at what point in time that there was going to be a global orphanhood crisis uh, because of COVID? I can remember clearly when I first began thinking about this tragic potential crisis of COVID-related orphanhood, I received a phone call over a crackling Zoom line from a colleague, Remy Hamapande, who's a pastor, a seminary professor in Zambia, and the director of a faith-based organization called Forgotten Voices. It was about two months into the pandemic, so it was May, and um, he says to me, Susan, if COVID comes here, and takes out all the grannies and the old people in our country the way it's doing in yours, we will have nobody left to take care of the orphans. I just don't know what we'll do. And I just thought, oh my goodness. And then I realized everybody thinks that because COVID, you know, it was the alpha wave at that point, COVID is primarily affecting older age groups in terms of mortality. And so people keep saying, well, your children are not affected. But if you're thinking of where like you serve, Mike, in Kenya and a lot of the countries around the world, the role of grandparents, they are so strategic in determining whether a child gets any care. And in fact, Zambia has the highest prevalence of children orphaned in the world. So it was telling and interesting that it was coming from Zambia. So I started laying in bed every night in my mind, my PhD is in epidemiology, and I began to map what indicators we would need to model to develop estimates of the number of children affected by COVID-related orphanhood in the countries most affected by COVID-related deaths. And having been familiar with the way those estimates were generated 
two decades ago for AIDS orphanhood, I actually knew what you would need to do. It's as simple as gathering data that's publicly available on UN population databases about fertility rates by age for women, then estimating those using scientific and demographic methods for men as well in five-year age brackets. And then once you know the average number of children a man or woman at any age and in any country should have by those five-year age brackets, you then just multiply that by the number of deaths in those five-year AIDS brackets for a given country, and you could generate estimates of orphanhood. Once I realized, I didn't know how to crunch the numbers or write the code, but I knew what needed to go into it. And I realized we really needed the smartest COVID modelers in the world there at Imperial College in Oxford. So at that point, I was still at CDC. I've worked there. I've worked there for about 30 years and just over the past year transitioned out to Oxford and to PEPFAR. So, but it, I was able to call a colleague at Oxford and I said to her, we are going to have the same thing that we saw for AIDS. We're going to have a lot of children orphaned, maybe not as many, but I promise you there are going to be a lot of them. And I think we need the smartest COVID modelers in the world. Help us. Do you know any of them? She goes, well, yes. One of them happens to be his son is in my son's playgroup. I'll ask him. She calls him and asks him and he goes, oh, no. How in the world did we forget about the children? And so he brings a team of five modelers with him. And then we realized we really needed to expand and include like really the, the top science experts in this area from Harvard, the director of child development, and also one of the other top uh, recognized researchers in this field, Dr. Sher from University College of London. And we also involved lean economists at the World Bank, the lead for orphans and vulnerable children from USAID, and two large faith-based organizations, because especially as a person of faith, it's very clear, and who's worked in the government for years, it's very clear to me that while you might have the bilateral and academic and multilateral organizations able to agree about evidence-based policies and programs and even fund them and um, describe strategies for delivering them. The first people in and the last people out are the faith-based Who are those organizations, Susan, if I might ask, those two faith-based? There's a very large Catholic one called Maestral International, and they work a lot with USAID on an entire Changing the Way We Care initiative to promote children being de-institutionalized out of orphanages into safe and loving families because the science shows that's what's really important and best for children. And the other one is a global organization called World Without Orphans. It's really a hybrid of movements and organizations in about 40 countries. But we knew they have the reach through national leaders on the ground down okay. to the local levels to be able to engage basically the Protestant community and the Catholic community, and all of those are committed as well to working across faiths and across those same sectors I mentioned in the beginning. So we were able to pull together that group. And by basically a little over a year into the pandemic, we were able to estimate that 1.5 million children additionally had been orphaned due to COVID. And everybody was shocked when we first had that Lancet paper come out in July of 2021. So basically a little over, we had data for a little over a year in the pandemic, but we knew we kept describing it as minimum estimates. And this is why that's important. You know, you can only link a child to a COVID death if that COVID death is reported. Mm -hmm. For the COVID death to be reported, there has to be a COVID test done on the person who died. And so, you know, even a year into the pandemic, there were so many countries that had very limited access to testing, particularly the poor and most vulnerable communities where the deaths tended to be the highest because of engagement in day labor and menial labor and crowded conditions and because of poverty, et cetera, and lack of access to care. So we knew those were minimum estimates because of limited access to testing and limited reporting of de- underreporting of deaths in countries around the world. What we really wanted to do was develop estimates of orphanhood linked to excess mortality. And excess mortality only means the extra number of deaths 
in any given country that occurred in a pandemic year, let's just say 2021, compared to the average number of deaths that would have been expected in the five years before the pandemic. So 2015, 2019 inclusive. So, you know, at that point, we only had excess mortality a year in from Europe and the U.S., basically not any other countries to speak up by Six months later, we realized, oh, my goodness, the numbers have more than doubled. We have more excess mortality now. We've had coming to the end of the Delta wave. We better, you know, publish again. And so six months later, we published again, and we are up to 5.2 million children affected by the end of uh, by orphan COVID related orphan hit. And still, it was minimum estimates. We really emphasize that because we still had problems with a lot of the low income countries yes. did not have excess mortality reporting or weren't testing. But now we just last week published our updated paper and we now know that 10.5 million children have been, uh, our estimates suggest that that, and again, those are the, those are the conservative, it's the lowest number, but we do have thanks to the WHO excess mortality estimates for every country in the world. And so that limitation we have, um, address that one and solved it. But you have the World Health Organization and the Economist and HDMI that out of University of Washington that report excess deaths. And of those, World Health Organization estimates are the lowest. So just to be conservative, we use the lowest estimates. And even using that, I mean, the fact that we have 6.4 million COVID deaths and 10.4 5 million children orphaned really should give us reason for a pause. And as Christ followers, we are very familiar with Psalm 68, 5 and 6 that say, God is the father to the fatherless. He takes the lonely and places them in families. Or James 1, 27 that says, this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God, our father, to visit widows and orphans in their distress. So we know we have this mandate as believers and invitation to see and care for the orphaned and widows among us. So it's um, quite gratifying to be able to work in an area that I feel called to as a believer. And I also am able to contribute to scientifically. So a very basic question I want our listeners to hear. I've heard you speak before, including at the Louisville conference last year, about what orphanhood actually is. And it took me by surprise initially to hear the definition, but I think it's important for our listeners, some of whom do not realize that it may not be what people think of as the traditional perspective of an orphan, that both parents are gone. So explain to us how you define orphanhood and why that matters. Orphanhood, according to UNICEF, is the death of one or both parents. And if the child only has one parent die, they're typically called a single orphan. If they have two parents die, they're called a double orphan. And the reason it's important is as follows. Just think for a minute about the fact that in a particularly most low and middle income countries, the primary breadwinner is the father. And so when the father dies, there is an increased risk even above and beyond when the mother dies of food insecurity, sexual abuse, and exploitation of the children, both boys and girls, and increased likelihood of dropping out of school. And a lot of that is tied to reductions in household income. But there's a lot of vulnerability that comes with having the father die. When the mother dies, you similarly also have an increase in exposures to violence over what would have happened if the mother had lived, but not as high as what happens when the father dies. An increased exposure to sexual violence and exploitation specifically. And you also have an increase in the mental health kind of problems that relate to Mm -hmm. isolation Mm -hmm. and PTSD and depression and anxiety and suicide risk. So overall, the loss of either parent is considered an adverse childhood experience that has immediate adverse consequences in the short term, but even in the long term increases the risk, honestly, of every major cause of death in adulthood, whether it's injuries or cardiovascular disease or infectious diseases or cancer, diabetes, et cetera. And a lot of people are not aware of the fact that loss of a parent or caregiver is one of the classic adverse childhood experiences that has long-term adverse consequences. 
Well, Susan, you were very kind to share with me a presentation that you've got coming up very soon uh, at a very a large meeting with your data and uh, findings. And it seems that there's a, the differential between the AIDS pandemic and the COVID pandemic is a whole lot more orphanhood in the developed world. Is Am I reading that right? Yes. You know, it's really disturbing. It took about 12 years for the AIDS pandemic to lead to 7 million children being orphaned. However, it took only two years for the COVID pandemic to lead to 7 million children orphaned. And I mean orphaned, they lost either their mother or their father, Mm -hmm. or some of them lost both. The speed of impact should not surprise us when we contrast how long it takes someone to die of HIV AIDS and how long it takes someone, and you'll know this so well from living in Kenya, how long it takes for COVID to kill someone. So with COVID, a lot of times it's two days to two weeks then and the person's dead after infection is diagnosed. And with HIV AIDS, in contrast, it's often five to 10 years. So no wonder it took 12 years in the AIDS pandemic to lead to 7 million children orphaned. And it took only two years in the COVID pandemic to lead to 7 million children being orphaned. So we certainly are not by that saying that one is more important than the other. We are saying both are global emergencies still, and we need to be identifying, assessing, and evaluating these children to see, are they okay? And are there services they need, whether they're health services, immunizations, or nutritional services, food insecurity, and needing increased food supplementation, educational services? Do they need help for scholarships to be able to stay in or backpacks or books or clothes even to be able to stay in school and even income support for the household, for the household to be able to continue to function and parenting support for the remaining caregiver who often themselves, you know, are grieving to be able to have the emotional and mental health wherewithal and the spiritual wherewithal to be able to care for the children. As I look through your report, uh, clearly there are some ethnic differences, uh, racial differences for children who've become vulnerable. And I noticed that American Indian or Alaska Native, almost uh, four to one uh, over the white population, black population as well. So would you make some comments about findings? Because a lot of this data certainly is from the developed world, uh, including North America. Let me take a step back for a minute about our paper in pediatrics that had to do with the U.S. orphanhood issue. And I really think it's important. So often when we work globally, I think we inadvertently, because we're focusing on another country, don't acknowledge that the same health problems that are afflicting other countries are afflicting our own. And orphanhood is no exception. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're one of the countries that has one of the like highest numbers of uh, COVID-related orphans in the world in the U.S. And it's because we had so many deaths, honestly, from COVID. You know, over a million deaths are certainly going to leave a lot of children orphaned. Additionally, just as we noted that there's difference by race and ethnicity in the likelihood of dying from COVID in the U.S. There are differences by race and ethnicity in the likelihood that a child would be orphaned due to COVID. So, for example, whereas minority populations overall in the United States only comprise 39 percent of the total population, they comprise 61 percent of the total number of children orphaned by COVID. And that disparity is just so disturbing. We believe that a lot of the differences by race, ethnicity, whether it's the Alaska Native population that was the most affected, but the Hispanic and African American populations of children were also egregiously affected. And we find that the increased risks often in the minority populations are linked to the individual and structural um, risk factors that often are linked to systemic racism and inequity of access to care and services and jobs and education. So often in those same populations, we're more apt to live in crowded households or be in crowded work situations as day wage earners and live in communities with decreased access to health care. 
Well, as we bring this down the home stretch for this conversation, numbers are sobering, no question about it. And I, I don't know if there's anybody else in the world who understands uh, orphans and vulnerable children associated with pandemics other than Dr. Susan Hillis. But what's happening uh, with the collaborative that you've discussed, whether faith-based or government ministries of health? And I really would like to focus on the church and what, what the church can and should be doing moving forward. Uh, but what are the challenges and the solutions to efforts to advocate for these kids? One of the challenges is just helping people begin to recognize the importance of seeing the children and then identifying them and then trying to evaluate whether they need help, and if they do, ensuring that they get the help they need. So if we could identify the children and then also influence both the political will of governments and also the, I think, spiritual will of church leadership to really make a difference for these churches, this problem actually carries hidden inside of it the opportunity to be bearers of hope around the world. And so let me talk about that. And that is because we know from two decades of identifying and caring for children who were orphaned and vulnerable due to the AIDS pandemic, we actually know what they're going to need. And we actually know how to deliver what works. And so in our report, that's called Children, the Hidden Pandemic, uh, the third edition that just came out, it's available for free online and from Oxford you can see that we propose that care for children be integrated into every pandemic. And that three-pronged approach would include, it's the three Ps. First, protect parents from dying by ensuring they're vaccinated and get treatment if they're sick. Number two, prepare families for alternative kinship care or foster care or adoption if both parents are dead or maybe there's a single parent and so the only parent died, but basically it's left the child with no parents. And number three, protect children from violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation, and address their mental health needs. So what I'm saying is we know through the health system how to collaborate with faith leaders and influencers to advance vaccination. And in a lot of countries, it's really the church that's made all the difference in being able to do that. I know in Kenya, that's the case, and in Zambia. Number two, for preparing families, one of the things that we can do more and more of, I think, within the faith community is just make the problem known and encourage people within the faith communities to consider becoming foster families or adoptive families or providing emergency care in the case that it's needed for children who are in dangerous situations. But the third aspect, um, protecting children from violence and abuse and neglect and exploitation and the financial problems, we know that there is economic support, sometimes even through helping with local backyard gardens if you're living in Kenya or family gardens if you're living in many countries around the world. Philippines has an amazing church-driven collaboration that does that. So addressing the food and economic problems, addressing the education problems by making sure that children can stay in school and really providing evidence-based psychosocial support for parents. We know that churches can do all of that and can do it really well. So I think there are the challenges, but the solutions are clear. And increasingly around the world, we are seeing church communities want to stand up and make a difference. I'll close by saying this. If all of us think about this question, do I know someone who died during the pandemic? Most of us do. I know several people who died. And then we say, do those people have children? And most of us will say, oh, yes, some of them do. And then have I ever even talked to those children to see how they're doing? I'm not sure what a lot of you would say, but I have made it my intention to try to talk to those children that I know from those families to see how they're doing. I have learned a lot from them, but I have also learned that often what they most need is something so simple and it's so well described in the New American Standard Version of the Bible, James 1, 27. This is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God our Father to visit widows and orphans in their distress. And a lot of times what they want is just someone to spend time with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so as I was starting working on all this uh, COVID orphanhood work sh- shortly after we published our first paper and while we were doing the analysis of the U.S. data, 
I began to pray that God would let me meet some young person affected by orphanhood in my community because I knew from the data they're everywhere. And I had friends around the world and some countries who had died and their kids had called me from Colombia, South America, for example, and from Zambia, but I did not know anyone here in my own backyard in Atlanta. And so lo and behold, my husband has pet alpacas and we live in Atlanta and they're out in a pen in the field um, behind our house. And it's not very common for people in a neighborhood in Atlanta to have pet alpacas. So it's common for us to see people standing at the fence staring. And so I looked out my window one day and lo and behold, this young girl standing at the fence staring. And I walked out just to welcome her and say hello, which is what we usually do. Uh, when I got to her, you know, I met her, I found out what her name was, and introduced myself. Her name is Kate Kelly. She's very comfortable with me telling her story. She's been interviewed by, I think, um, Washington Post and I think maybe even New York Times with our first paper. But she says the first sentence I hear her say is, oh, no, I lost the heart that holds my daddy's ashes. I've got to find it. And I just thought, oh my goodness. And I looked and she had a little silver chain around her neck that had a place for a pendant, but the, there was no pendant there. And we looked on the ground and lo and behold, about, there was this little silver locket about a half inch long. And, you know, it clearly was holding, uh, holding something and it was holding her daddy's ashes. And so I helped her pick it up and I just said like, what happened? And she said, you know, Dr. Hillis, my daddy died not with COVID, but because of COVID. And I told her, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. And I told her a little bit about the work I'm doing. And then she said, well, let me tell you what happened. He went to urgent care because he was having a bad cough. And they said, your test for COVID is negative. We think you're going to be okay. Just go back home. He goes back home. And two days later at work, he had a major heart attack and died. He was the information technology lead for one of the largest mega churches in Atlanta. And she just said it was so heartbreaking to her. She goes, I know well enough that most people with COVID recover. My daddy died with a heart attack, but he died because there were so many COVID infected people in the hospital. They didn't have room for him. And she said, I know also I will never recover. I will never have my daddy in my wedding pictures. I will not have him in my picture him in my pictures when I go to my prom in two weeks. He will never again in my life be in another picture. He is gone. I will never recover. So I just think like that we have young people walking around full of feelings like that still. Mm -hmm. And I think we can find them, reach out to them, develop a relationship with them. I have kept a relationship with her and every two months or so we connect. So that's a, that's an example of what every one of us can do something. It's something small for us might be something really big for that young person. Wow. Thank you for sharing that story, Susan. Well, Dr. Hillis, there's no question that you are a glo the global champion for orphans and uh, so grateful for your work. And um, God has put you in a very important position. You, you, you quoted one of those scriptures that was on my mind to close with. Uh, another one is Isaiah 117, where Isaiah says, learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. So thank you for being a champion and challenging us today at CMDA to not forget about the least of these because the greatest of these cares deeply about those. And he said, let them come to me. Don't hinder them. So God bless you in all of your efforts uh, to take care of the kids, including your own 11. Thanks so much. Great to be with you today. Blessings to all of your listeners. And thanks a lot. You know, I first heard Dr. Hillis speak at the Global Missions Health Conference last year. She was one of three speakers who addressed the COVID pandemic head on, and that's why I wanted her to join us today. I was incredibly impressed with her knowledge and her experience and her research in addressing topics such as adverse childhood experiences, violence, vulnerability, and HIV in the United States and around the world. And now her groundbreaking work as co-author of the study called Children, the Hidden Pandemic 2021. It was jointly published by the CDC as well as USAID and some others. You can find a link to that critical report in our show notes today. 
One clear theme that struck me during my discussion with Dr. Hillis is her deep passion for meeting the needs of suffering children. I think you heard it. We need to take her message to heart and not forget the children who've been impacted by the pandemic in these last two and a half years. How can we as Christians in healthcare make a difference in the current and future well-being of the orphan children that we see in our practices, in our communities, and even around the world? One particular way that you can make a difference is to get involved with CMDA's Global Health Outreach, otherwise known as GHO. You've heard me mention GHO many times on this podcast. Well, that's because it's a perfect opportunity for you to use your God-given skills in healthcare to provide care to the poor and needy while sharing the gospel. Some of GHO's trips are even focused on orphan care. Each year we send 40 to 50 teams around the world to places like El Salvador, East Africa, India, the Pacific, Central Asia, Nicaragua, the Middle East, and many other countries. You can find out more information and get yourself registered for an upcoming trip by going to cmda.org gho. I think we all realize, of course, that we can make a difference in our own backyards. You can find a local free clinic in your own community to volunteer at or take referrals from. If you're a student or a resident, you can sign up to do an away rotation at a mission hospital or a Christian clinic. CMDA has numerous ways to connect you and equip you to live on mission each and every day. If you have any questions about how to get started, you can learn more through CMDA's Center for Advancing Healthcare Missions. You can go to cmda.org slash CAM, C-A-H-M, if you'd like to learn more. I'd like to also put in a word for our friends at Christian Community Health Fellowship, or CCHF for short. If you're not familiar with CCHF, it is a national organization that encourages, engages, and equips Christians as well as Christian health centers throughout our country, and they endeavor to show God's love through living and providing health care among the poor and marginalized. Being on mission each and every day is a focus that we at CMDA share with our friends at CCHF. And I'm encouraged by the ways both of these God-ordained ministries over many decades offer opportunities to serve in missions both here in the United States and across the world. Before we close, here's Jamie for a very important announcement. If you have a heart for missions and you want to learn how to live missionally in your life in the U.S. or around the globe, then we encourage you to register now for the Global Missions Health Conference. This year's event is scheduled for November 10th through 12th at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. And when you get there, be sure to look for the CMDA neighborhood in the exhibit hall. We'd love to introduce you to a variety of ways you can use your skills to serve others. Visit cmda.org slash events for more information. Well, before I wrap up this week, I just wanted to give a shout out uh, to two of our staff who help me every single week to pull off this CMDA Matters podcast. Rusty Sluter is our sound technician who's been working at CMDA for a couple of decades. And Mrs. Mandy Morin, our director of communications, as she helps put together our script and organizes all of these wonderful interviews. Thank you, Rusty and Mandy, for all of your wonderful help. Well, I hope you'll join me next Thursday for a special episode that features two lead researchers from the Theology, Medicine, and Culture program at Duke Divinity School. Their presentation recently at CMDA headquarters was just too good to keep to ourselves, so I wanted to share it with you on the podcast next week. As always, if you want to suggest a future guest to join us for this podcast, you can email your suggestion at cmdamatters at cmda.org. And if you like our podcast, I say it every week, but I want to say it again. Just give us a five-star rating and share us on your favorite social media platform. In closing today, I want to reiterate something that Dr. Hillis just shared with us. She said, quote, What is God inviting us to contribute now and in the future? What a great challenge for you and for me this week. What can we do, friends, to contribute to the health and well-being of children whose lives have been forever changed during this pandemic? 
How can we tangibly bring the hope and healing of Christ to an orphaned child's world? I pray that after hearing the data from Dr. Hillis about a crisis of 10.5 million COVID orphans in our world right now, orphanhood matters to you more than ever before. And what matters to you matters to CMDA and CMDA matters. We'll see you next week, friends, God willing. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.